this would be just because of our great programming here, Bridging Academia and the Professional Theatre, but really it is to honor one of our masters, one of our elders of the tribe, but one of the really grand masters in chess, one would say, and uh, a unique um, theatre person. And he is right uh, next to us right now in the uh, dressing room. So he will come here with uh, Cameron Steele, who is someone who studied with him. Cameron also studied a lot with uh, uh, Robert Wilson, but also uh, with Tadashi Suzuki, and he translated uh, uh, to establish him and his work, and so it's a great, um, uh, I think, really great and rare opportunity to, to listen to uh, one of the masters. So I'll try to say as little as possible, so I won't bore you too much, and try to have questions under 10 words. If you have a cell phone, uh, maybe now also is the time, just take it out. Everyone, yeah, and uh, make sure and double check uh, it is not um, not um, on the ring. And again, um, thank you all for coming. And I will go now and um, get uh, to that Hizuki and Cameron. And again, thank you for coming. The Siegel Center Bridges Academia and uh, Professional Theater International and American Theater. And for a long time, we have, of course, tried to get him here. We did one evening about his new uh, book, The Culture is the Body, with Cameron. He sent us a video, but it's a great honor to have him here. It's also the end of our season. We had a big season. You have the book in front of us. So it's a sad and beautiful moment for us uh, all together here at the Seagulls. And I would like to thank everybody involved, Rebecca and Brad and Michael, you, Chen, Isabella, um, everybody who really worked so hard to make uh, 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 this uh, season so great. So thank you for coming. And we will be coming in right now. Thank you.
So um, again, thank you all for coming and joining us here at the Siegel Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY in the name of the Siegel Center and the PhD program in theater with Peter Eckersall. We really welcome you here and thank you uh, to Dashi Suzuki for taking the time out of your life to uh, spend uh, a moment with us. Um, we had a little discussion before and we thought about a couple of questions and I think we decided to, I'm going to read them to him and then he will uh, respond uh, to the questions in, in a, a free association way. And we have two more chairs here, two more chairs there. I mean, we, we fill them up before we, uh, before we start. Is someone sitting here? Yeah, so just take from us. Again, so thank you so much. And um, questions we had uh, uh, for, for um, Tadashi Suzuki, who is here to show the Trojan women mm -hmm. in uh, Saratoga in collaboration with the CT company, where there are also significant conference will take place, focusing on his work and impact on the global world of theater, but also on, uh, on America especially. So our questions were, how did it feel for him to be uh, back uh, in the US after 15 years. It's a very long time for anybody who is uh, uh, such a prominent uh, figure in, in world uh, theater. The play, The Trojan Women, which is a play from the 80s, perhaps many say his signature play, and he felt strongly that this play should come here and it will be performed uh, up in Saratoga. So why, why that play now? And what are the ideas behind it? Um, he is part, one could say, of the 68 generation coming out of Japan. And, uh, and uh, if, so our question is, what does he think now? What theater should be concerned about? What is it concerned about? What should it be concerned about? And what could it be really concerned about? Um, he studied, as you know, um, political science. He didn't start right away in acting schools and uh, in the uh, Stella Adler studios of the world. He came from political science and then developed his unique uh, work. Um, so our thought was like Bertolt Brecht, who also believed in the science of theater. Um, is there a method? Is there a science? And can it be adopted globally, what he uh, created and found as a model? Is the body, the last book that Cameron translated, and we had a great evening here at the Siegel Center of Art, you know, is the body, after all, and this is the message of his work, the, the center of communication of culture and art, and also globally in between countries and communicate history. And we, uh, of course, want to perhaps know a little bit more about Toga, what you saw on the this most impressive uh, uh, structure he created, perhaps also a big inspiration for Robert Wilson for his watermill center, a bit more about Toga, but also he's contemporary working in China a lot on Asian uh, uh, countries and um, Indonesia and uh, looking at traditions and uh, who perhaps are vanishing and bringing his, uh, his, his work to it. So it's a very long question and a big field. Normally I try to be much shorter, I, 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 I promise, and I stay too way out of it, but um, Tadashi, please. <coughs> So before I get into the details of these questions, he wants to give you a, a more of an overall picture of why he uh, began to do theater in the first place. So his first impulse, actually, when he wanted to be expressive, be an artist, was actually to be uh, a novelist. And he was very interested in uh, French culture, French literature, and Russian literature at the time. And also interested in the uh, culture and literature coming from uh, the, Latin, the Latin world. French, Greek. From the, the whole Mediterranean diaspora. And then he hit upon the problem of, you know, why do theater? He, in the moment that he was having these feelings, he looked at the theater that was happening around him and he didn't like any of it. So it's an interesting uh, place from which he began. He was a uh, political science economics major at Waseda University when he started. 
それから世界をどう見るかポイントビューです見るかということをに興味を持ってたんですね。And because he had that field of study, he was really looking at the bigger picture. He was trying to formulate as a young man a world view. What place does Japan have in the world? What, what's going on in the world right now? He was concerned and hitting up against these big ideas. And he thought the best way to interrogate and explore these questions was not through economic studies or through political studies, but in fact through the theater. And there's three main reasons behind that. First is theater uses language, uses words. And it has an important role in the process of theater. And it needs a body in space. And it's something that you have to do in a community, in a group. So, so through those lenses of language, uh, the body, uh, you can you can view each of the of the and also the way the way different people work in groups, group, body, and language. It's a lens through which you can see the differences between each culture, each group. So if you look at the way that language is used, you can understand history. So you don't only understand history and tradition uh, by looking at language, but you can also understand a kind of mentality. So you can understand the sensitivities of a certain group. Or the aesthetics of a certain group by examining language. And he thought that's a, a good tool, a good way to investigate uh, different kinds of cultures, different kinds of people. And then there's the body. So we may think that we all share more or less the same body, but if you actually look at each person, even though we're all the same species, we're quite different if you look at each individual. And you can see from you can see from looking at a person's body the kind of upbringing they had, the kind of household they lived in. And you can also see the kind of you know DNA. So because of those things, the same kind of bacteria, if a person is infected with it, it, it uh, has a different effect based on that individual makeup. So the way those uh, symptoms show up in different bodies is completely different based on the body. And how long it takes for it to show. It's, and also, depending on the age, all of these things uh, are shown by the body. And so, by looking at the body and being aware of the body, you can right away see the difference between yourself and the other. So, oftentimes the theater is thought of as like this very sort of direct relationship between uh, the one director and one actor. But for him, he thinks of it more as you know, at least three. You need a group, you need uh, a sense of community and shared grammar with a people uh, to create what he thinks the theater is. So once you get more than once you get more than three people working on something, you start to create the idea of, of, of a nation, of a, of a community. You start to create rules that are shared by this group of people. 
でそのルールを受け入れるか受け入れないかってことは問われてくるんですよグループにいるってこと And so what allows someone to be brought into that group or not is whether they agree with or have a kind of empathy with the rules that are set up. So then, so then, rule to you, so the group, no, that's going to be the problem. And then, of course, you run into the problem of like, well, who's going to set the rules? Now, the problem of like, well, who's going to set the rules? If you look at American politics right now, you can see that problem pretty clearly. China, China, And in China as well, you can see that problem pretty clearly. And within one group, you have subgroups that appear. And then they make their own rules within the bigger group. Anyway, if you want to create anything that has a degree of continuity to it, you need rules. そうそうそ,うそのルールっていうものはどういう形でできてくるかっていうのが大変面白いんです。And so one of the interesting things to study is how, how those rules are made. What's the process through which you know, that shared grammar rules are, are arrived at? でそのルールの持続性ですね。持続力っていうのはどういうふうにして保たれるか。So how do you make rules that will last, right? That will, that will stand the test of time. つまり劇団ですね。So, in the case of the theater, you have a, a troupe、uh, who's you know, creating work、uh, based on a set of rules.、Uh, and if the rules don't hold with that group, then the company dissolves. There is friction within the group, people don't agree, it falls apart. そうするとグループっていうのにも歴史があってそれをどういうふうに解決していったかっていう、うん、やっぱり解決するかっていうルールがいるんですね。And so you need to have a way to resolve you know, creative conflict. You need to have something to fall back on、uh, to, to have solutions to the, these internal rifts that happen within groups. そうするとランニングですね。それからボディそれからル、うん、グループ。この三つを見ていると。まあ、最初は自分の国の特性た,ただし自分の国の特殊性とかユニークさっていうものはそれは他人と比較しないと出てきませんから必ずそこの3つを考えていくと他の国の問題が出てくるんです。So, 他の国はどうかって。So one of the things that help create this rules is、uh, by examining this idea of the other, the other culture. Uh, you know, we try to build rules based on the body, language and, and how the group operates. But then one way to,、uh, to create these rules is to, as a group, decide well, how do we feel about this culture, this person, this event that's outside of the group? How do we view that as, as a company? So, for, in his case, he couldn't create a company and only think about Japanese problems. You need something to hit up against, you need something to, to create a kind of objective distance. でその時私はあのー、まあ、えー、私の家庭環境は日本の伝統的なあの芸能の関係環境なんですが、まあ、ヨーロッパっていうものに興味を持ったと。In his case, he grew up in a family where、uh, there was a degree of、uh, Japanese traditional、uh, performing arts uh, uh, practice going on. And at the same time, he had an interest in, in European culture and literature. So, the 日本はどう,どうでじゃあ違う国はどうなんだって言った時に出てきたのがグリープトラジティなんです。And so when he was in this process of looking at his own culture's tradition and looking at traditions outside of his culture, the thing that really landed with him was the tradition of Greek tragedy. ですから早い時期につまりヨーロッパ文化の,あのオリジンですからね。So, it's not really the source of Anglo Saxon culture, but when we think of you know, the source of what is now called Western culture, you know, Greek tragedy is at the center of that. So, 
、まあ、ヨーロッパのオリジナルグリークっていうところにちょっと焦点を絞ったっていうことがあるんですね。So he had this knowledge of Japanese traditional performing arts and then he had this interest and kind of resonance with、uh, you know, European history and culture and in particular Greek tragedy. And that was the sort of springboard from which he, he began his exploration. And he wasn't doing it in necessarily a scholarly way. He doesn't consider himself a scholar. He thought just studying it through, through language was not going to, just studying it through, through reading and writing was not going to be enough. ラテン系、まあ、グリックトラジディっていうのはかなりあのベースにあるんですよねあの。ヨーロッパの芸術のベースにグリックトラジディっていうのはあるのでグリックトラジディがなぜ,なぜこういう芝居ができてどういう特殊性を持ってるユニークさを持ってるかをこれをもうちょっとやってみようとこう思ったんですね。So he really decided to go deep into what... What was at the core of the structure of Greek tragedy, Greek tragedy which was you know, behind a lot of the great work, subsequent works in, in European、uh, history, in literature,、uh, in all of the Mediterranean cultures. This was at the core. So he wanted to look at how was it structured and what is it that made it tick. I don't think I'm going to be in the world. I'm going to be in the world. I'm going to be in the world. 例えば世界中に浸透していくっていうようなあの雰囲気がありましたね。So the feeling when he was growing up in Japan was, you know, Western culture had permeated around the world. That no matter what culture you, you travel to, Western culture and the traditions of Western culture were, were there, were part of, of the base of operations of whatever else was going on. 特にあのアジアの知的層はそういうふうに思いましたね。ヨーロッパの文化っていうのはユニバーサルであってくる、ね。Especially the intellectual circles in Japan at the time. コンプレックスみたいなもの。They were very much based in a reading of, of Western classics、uh, and there was a kind of inferiority complex that、uh, resulted in, in the dialogue. 特に演劇ではそう。現代演劇ではそうです。Especially in the contemporary theater of the time. 私はそういうふうに演劇にアプローチしてないので、別にそういうコンプレックスで近づいたわけではない。But he didn't feel that way. He didn't have this kind of inferiority complex, but he was interested in what structures were lying behind it.、うん、で、ここに共通するものもあるんじゃないかと、こう思ったんですね、むしろどっちかと。And he started to think there must be some universal principles that are shared between This Greek tragic、uh, source material that was you know, permeated throughout the world and within his own、uh, Japanese tradition. He thought there must be some. And that was in his 30s he was starting to make that exploration. And the result of that first exploration was the production of the Trojan Women. And this is, one, this is the first production that he brought、uh, to the United States in 1979 to Brooklyn College,、uh, the production of Trojan Women. It was 38 years ago. Yeah, 40 years <laughs> ago. And then Ellen Stewart、uh, invited him to La Mama in 1982, and he brought、uh, the Baka. And so his, his creations based on his exploration of Greek tragedy were the first productions that, in fact, he brought to the United States. So the Greek tragedy was, I think, was a very good thing. So the Greek tragedy was a very good thing. So the Greek tragedy was a very good thing. So the Greek tragedy was a very good thing. And so, one of the things he discovered in his exploration was that there, he, he realized that, in fact, the structure that exists in, in Greek tragedy, especially in the production of Greek tragedy,、uh, there were some similarities between,、uh, tra between traditions that existed in Japan that exist today.、Still. And there's basically three points of commonality. The first being that the theater developed out of、uh, 
religious ceremony. Uh, and the other is something you don't see so much in the modern theater, the, the use of a chorus. And finally, uh, the use of mask. These elements you can find in uh, the theater of the No. Mm, and so the, the protagonists uh, usually are, are, are coming from a, a kind of a, situa a family situation, right? And the, the structure of the space also was similar. So you, in... Uh, in the Greek amphitheater, for example, the actors would speak their text to the seat of Dionysus, where the, where the, where the priest of Dionysus would often sit and would sort of have a dialogue with God through that point of focus in the space. So the performance and the acting uh, was created with an awareness of the hierarchy of the space the actor on the stage, uh, the seat of uh, the, the priest, and then God, right? this kind of like triangle, and then the audience being witness to that. And in the no, you had a similar structure. You had a very specific seat in the audience where the shogun would sit, and the actors would speak directly to that. Point in space. And so the way you move, everything is done in relation to that focal point in the space. In, in realism, you talk like this. How are you? It does it. You don't say, I'm going to kill you this way. You say it this way. <laughs> so he was, he, was, he was inspired by this sharing of, L, of strategies. The, the use of the space also was quite different than modern theater. Right? Uh, so there's a, a, a German uh, architect. Miss van der Rohe. Do you know this person? Miss van der Rohe, yes. yes. Okay. yes. Modernist. Okay. Mm. So the idea of in his architecture was that was to sort of take hierarchy out of the out of the picture in other words wherever you are in the space uh, the quality is the same the, the light is the same the temperature is the same it was a kind of democratic way to imagine a space so basically what, uh, what makes modern space <coughs> modern is the fact that we've lost this hierarchy. We've lost a kind of central focal point. It's become everyone equal. It's, Nietzsche. Hmm? Nietzsche. <laughs> oh, like Nietzsche says in the... In the, in the <laughs> Right, the, 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 the God is dead, right? So God has left the space. There's no center. So it was, it was from seeing that commonality of strategies that he hit upon the idea of 
of using uh, the text of Greek tragedy to make a new creation. And then, just to respond to your question of why uh, the Trojan women now. He, he finds the, the themes that the Trojan women addresses to be quite contemporary. So Euripides is the author of the Trojan women. So what happens in the story is that the Greeks go and they annihilate Troy. All of the uh, warriors, the males, are destroyed, right? The so what happens in contemporary warfare is different. You, there's a kind of an invasion that happens and a taking over of the country. And there's a, you know, there's a creation, there's a colonization that takes place. So the idea of completely annihilating not just the people but all of the buildings, all of the culture uh, in one shot is something unique to the, what happens in the play. The idea is a complete annihilation of, of the enemy. And there's this famous scene where Achilles uh, kills Hector, and it's not enough to have killed him. He strings him up to the back of his uh, carriage and parades him around uh, to show. He makes a show of the destruction of Hector. So he sees a, a strong connection between this and the kinds of things ISIS is doing today. Mentality. The, the mentality behind those kinds of actions, the symbolism of them. So when he talks about sort of an ancient mentality of those days, it's this kind of extremism. So this, uh, the awareness of this, um, you know, human tendency to of total destruction is something that came about in, in the Mediterranean culture of that time. Right? And if you look at the, what the Nazis did, it was a similar kind of idea, this idea of total annihilation of a people. This idea of, you know, Total destruction of, of, a, of a race or of a clan. で、そう、そういう、それで、しかし、それはまあ、ヨーロッパの場合、その批判的な勢力、抵抗する勢力がいっぱいあって、それについての大きな反省が起こったってことあるんですが、今、ISがやってることは、あの、しかもですよ、国
depicted so depicted so clearly in the in the Greek tragedies. So the most of the the Jewish na koto ga aru desu ne. Kore wa UDP desu tte sonzai nan desu. So another important uh, point to think about when analyzing, you know, why this is such an important important play is the is the existence of Euripides himself. Kore Euripides desu tte na katta girisha ga ano hito nan desu yo ne. So Euripides was a Greek. He was from the winning side. He wasn't a, a victim, he wasn't a Trojan who wrote the play. So he was shocked that it was a play written by a Greek criticizing his own country, his own culture. It's something that's difficult to do and get away with. Right? <laughs> So this idea of being from a country that completely annihilates another and then to write a play from the point of view of the victim's side and not just write a play about it, but put it in a public forum, was something incredibly to do, not only in his time, but today. Right. And he thought the will and courage to do that was, was impressive. So when you decide to get in a kind of enemy relationship with another, like for example when Bush uh, got involved in the uh, Iraq war, right, he called them evil. Right. And so what he understood with, with that language is it's okay to kill them. Right. So in any human being, if you're under the right circumstances, if you're threatened, you have the capacity to kill another human being, right? regardless of the country you're in, China or Russia. Once you have a, a mortal enemy, the, the, the will and the ability to kill appears. Right? So what happens is you, there's a suspension of judgment. There's a suspension of thinking of whether what you're doing is good or not. You're in that relationship and so you have permission so he thinks it's important for you know, you know, political leaders to come out and have strong uh, opinions and, and make strong actions at times. That's that's obviously necessary for the world to to continue. But one of the things that's harder to grasp and what this play does such a good job of is this kind of ancient uh, mentality, this ability within the human being to completely annihilate the other uh, still exists. That potential still lives in us today. And that's why he thinks uh, Greek tragedy is still pertinent today. So, so it's the sort of thing, you know, there, there are people from modern realism like Ibsen and, and, and writers like this uh, that are thought to have but thought to sort of continue to carry some kind of message today. But 
what Greek tragedy is so good at is, is making very clear uh, the extreme kind of situations in which human beings can find themselves. So it's the, he's presenting situations in which human beings uh, you know, cannot find uh, a solution for in their daily lives. So whether it's political conflict or military conflict, he's, he, he's attracted to those kinds of problems that don't have an easy solution. So basically, when he's choosing plays, he, he tries to find things that don't have an easy solution. Just in thinking about the way he leads his daily life, when he, when he runs up against a conflict written about in these plays that he can't right away figure out how to solve, that's what pulls him in. あの、he feels that the Greek tragedies are the are the plays that, you know, have the most extreme and most clear uh, conflicts uh, that are attractive to. それでですね、あの、え、だいたいまあ so one of the things he thinks is important into understanding any culture, uh, understanding one's own culture, is to go outside of it, mm. right? To travel outside of it so you get a kind of objectivity. So, so the way he began that was going to, to Europe and to Greece, and the next major step outside of Japan that he made was uh, to the uh, to Russia. Yeah, he did a production of King Lear at uh, the Moscow Arts Theater. And they're still doing his training there today. And uh, King Lear is now part of the, the repertory that they perform. And then, you know, before he went to Russia, he was also regularly in the United States and had a lot of interest here. And then after being here, he started to think about what is capitalism. <laughs> And so the years that he was here in the United States was right before Perestroika, right before the Iron Curtain fell and you know the, the communist experiment was shown not to work. So he was wondering, so what is capitalism? So one of the reasons why he's so interested in China now is it's it's still rampant capitalism, but it's state capitalism. It's communist capitalism. There's no election. So you 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 sort of have to be a capitalist there. It's it's not democratic, it's it's state capitalism. He's wondering like how's that gonna hold up? It's something that's actually, if you look at history, it's actually never happened. Right. And there's people that are really interested in and want to continue with that way that it's going, and there's other people that uh, are very much against it. But it, in, in any case, it's having a huge influence on the world right now. So if you look at historically uh, national social, socialism or communism uh, or, or all of those movements that happened in Europe in the 20th century, they had a, a huge influence over the entire world. 
壊れて、まあ、ベゲットとかタルトルとかみんな出てきたんですけど。And when that experiment failed, you had playwrights like Beckett and Arabal and Ionesco showing up talking about this wasteland, the conflicts that those ideas created left behind. それからアメリカも今希望があるかなっていう感じはもうするでしょう。And he's wondering now if maybe that sort of era of wasteland and of, of ending of an ideal is coming to the United States, perhaps. Everybody has this idea of the American dream, and it's good to have that and be passionate about that, but maybe. There is a kind of deception that's going on behind that. Right now, there's a big China dream going on. A lot of people are behind that in China. Of course, there is a critical voice about that idea, but there's a, a large force that believes in that and is moving that idea forward. And so, really, the idea of you know, how the theater in China is going to respond to that, it's an interesting moment, especially when you look at theater and the process of making theater via language, via the body, via the way groups and rules are formed. It's an interesting moment. So these are the, this is kind of the base of his thinking, and he's sort of set that out for you.、Uh, <laughs> and so he doesn't have any more to say. <laughs> Now you just have to see the play. <laughs> he, he sort of, he sort of, you know, it was a stream of consciousness explanation of what was going on. He went there and here. And So instead of you know, responding to each of these questions individually, he really wanted to give you first an idea of his worldview、uh, and why he thought to make theater in the first place and to get the base ideas behind that、uh, clear to you. Bruce, thank you very much.、Um, what is your very first memory of theater ever? So, Suzuki grew up in a household where、uh, there were musicians、uh, who accompany、uh, the, the Bunraku,、uh, a traditional form of puppetry in Japan, which is called Bunraku. They, they're, in, in his case, they were、uh, operated with, with strings.、Uh, and next to that puppet is、uh, a musician playing a shamisen, a string. And so at the same time that you play, there's a, there's a, a vocal, vocalization and a. a and you have to sit in seiza with your knees on the ground, sort of sit on your heels. And then, for example, you sit、ね、here, and over there, there's an old man. And when he was、uh, in elementary school, he remembers seeing this. And so the old man sitting there said, Come over here. And he was playing the shamisen. <laughs> Makes all these voices. And he was really terrified by these sounds that were coming from his body. <laughs> and, and, and the expressions in his face as he made these sounds and played the instrument. 
<laughs> he thought he was going to die. <laughs> he thought it was going to be like Mishima Yukio, you know, committing harakiri. And, and, you know, from this kind of intense body, the voice would come. It seemed like a kind of hysteria. <laughs> and so he'd try not to look because it was so it was too much for him. So when he'd sort of shift his body not to look, someone behind would like hit him on the back with a stick. Look. And you may know this, but if you sit in, in Seiza for a long time on your knees, you know, sooner or later you're gonna lose circulation in your in your calves, in your legs, right? You can't really relax when you're in this position. Keep your tension and keep your position. I hate Japanese culture. <laughs> and then he thought, God, this is theater. I, I never want to do this. <laughs> so I'm going to go study French literature. <laughs> And so he, every moment he had, he read French literature, whether he was in the bathroom, on the toilet, wherever, whatever he was doing, he would try to escape. <laughs> that was his first memory. <laughs> but lately he's thinking that was, that was a good experience to have. <laughs> But it was, it was shocking to the system. It was hard to get through. Yeah. Um, if you see these uh, traditional forms of Asian theater now in Indonesia or China, what, how, how the, what is the future of that? How, what is his intervention? What, is this, what does he bring there? What does he do, really do? Indonesia or Korea, you can see it. Yes, that's right. So the, the cases between Indonesia and, and, and China are different, obviously. But in the case of China, you know, the different dynasties, uh, you know, changed the way the culture developed over history, for example. Changing often. Mm, so basically, the it, it came out of an agricultural you know, tradition. Mm, so before before the agricultural uh, civilization existed in uh, in China, there was a kind of civilization that was, that was driven by by horses, by, by the use of horse. And another big difference uh, is that in China, there's the use of the chair, right? So the yeah. connection to the floor is, is different. In Japan, you would sit on top of tatami or on top of straw. It's a connection directly. Even within the house, you would sit directly on the floor. And because of that, there's a little bit more of a connection with Indonesia and, and Japan. And, and also in Japan, the, the use of uh, rice fields and rice paddies and, and, and planting within water. Uh, and through doing that kind of uh, planting, you, you get a different uh, sort of, you develop a different sensitivity in your feet. He's going to show you. <laughs> So if you just kind of jump into the rice paddy, you're going to slide and sink into it, right? So it's, it's, it's soft, so in order not to sink on it, you need to walk a certain way. You have to hold on with your core, with your center of gravity, to keep your balance and not sink suddenly. Yes, 
If you, if, you if you can't keep your clear line with your center as you walk through the rice paddy, the, the way you distribute the rice uh, seeds isn't going to be even. So how you're able to control your center as you, as you cross the rice paddy to distribute the seeds becomes very important. And if you look at sumo wrestlers, there's a similar phenomenon. And also in judo, other martial arts. If, if they have to make a quick cross, they keep the level of their center the same. Same in the no, when, when you cross the space, the height of your center is the same. In China, that exists, but but it's more up and down. It's more of a, the center rises and falls more. If you look at Indonesian culture, there's more of a connection to the ground, and there's still in the everyday life there, there's a you know, religious ritual from Islam and from the Hindi, Hindu culture. It still exists in everyday life, and so you can see that connection very clearly in those rituals. So Judy and uh, Julie Taymor, for example, spent a lot of time in Indonesia watching the way, when she was young, watching the way uh, the traditional performing artists move. Understood. <laughs> the way they could quickly lower their center close to the ground. And that's something he did recently in, a, in an audition. <laughs> when he, he had the Indonesian actors come out and then suddenly they all... Even, even though uh, Clytemnestra was speaking her text, she... In Indonesia, you have everyone basically able to do that, very flexible in this part of their body. In, in Japan, nowadays, that actually flexibility is going away in China also. Also in Islamic uh, ceremonies, there's a, there's a strong connection to the floor. Right? So in Japan, in the house, you have the tatami or the straw mats that you're walking on. But in Indonesia, it's directly with the earth. It's on the ground that there's this uh, relationship. So that's a big difference. So one of the most uh, noticeable differences is, you know, for example, you go to Greece and you see that the, the theaters are made of stone. <laughs> you can't use your feet in a dynamic way. You can't stomp. You can't do Suzuki training on that space. It's made of stone. You'll hurt yourself. <laughs> you, in order to uh, develop a sensitivity in your feet, in the bottoms of your feet, you need a, you need a space that's able to be pliable. <laughs> surface. So in Indonesia, they still have that you know, connection with the pliable earth. In Japan, now it's so westernized, they've, they've, they're losing that a little. Westernized, It's become Americanized. <laughs> I was trying to sort of yeah. avoid that. Before, yeah. Before we take maybe one or two of the audience questions, uh, really one question about toga. Um, this incredible dream or, or vision of, uh, of th for the theater and for the world. So it's kind of a very local place, but also such a global place. Um, over the decades, does he think, is this theater a global, do we all have to think in global connections now? の話しましたね。グループ的にグループ。それで人間同士っていうのは何によって集団として結束できるのかってことを考えたんですね。
So his reason for going to Toga, and those of you who don't know, Toga is a small hamlet way in the mountains of, of yeah. Japan, and he brought his company there. And, and the reason he went there was he wanted to figure out how to create a group. Right. So in the case of ballet, classical ballet, there is a, a process through which you're able to become part of a group of ballerinas, right? You need to transform your body to be able to enter into that grammar, right? And musicians have a grammar. They need to become proficient at it in order to be part of the conversation, right? And so he thought, what do I need to do to create a kind of theatrical grammar? What, wh how do I create a group that shares such a grammar? Well, one way is to have a, a great writer and to have a group of performers that are around that writer. Well, one thing that's important is you need to economically support that group, right? You, you, you have you know, a, a chunk of money and you evenly distribute that to the people that are there and that's one way to support the group, right? To keep it together. But if you look at if you look at music, uh, even if you have a great composer, that composer alone is not necessarily what makes a group of musicians able to play together. Form a group. So what? But what can I do in the theater? I thought, what could I do in the theater to make a group possible? Right. I had a two-pronged two approach to this. And so the first thing was to create a physical grammar that all the actors could share. Right? その人たちを計測させるんじゃないかっていう考え方も一つ。これは宗教の技ですね。例えば寺院とかこうスペースがありますよね。特殊なこのグループが集まるためのスペースを作ったんですね。宗教は。And another really another really important part of this is the creating with that group a relationship with a space, right? Much in the way that you know, religious groups have a very special relationship with a place of worship. You know, a, a theater company needs to have a space in which they work and a deep relationship that's developed in which they develop that grammar. So there were two basic things he wanted to do in Toga. Create a method which would uh, you know, be supporting of his style uh, that all the members of the group would share, and then to have that group, from their own efforts, create a space and create a relationship with that space. So if you if you know sushi, you know this uh, norimaki. You'd be wrapping in, in nori seaweed. Uh, you know, it's a roll, right? Huh? Uh, so, so one of the reasons why uh, sushi rolls work is because the rice sticks together. Yeah. Mm, it's all sushi rice. It's all been cooked a certain way with vinegar and it sticks together. Yeah. But that alone isn't enough. You need to wrap a bunch of nori around it to keep it really together. Yeah. And so that, the idea is that you have all the pieces of rice sticking together and they're surrounded by the, the nori seaweed. Yeah. <laughs> 
And the thing that makes the pieces of rice stick together is the grammar, is the, is the training. And he realized that to, to, and he realized to really make sticky rice in the purest way uh, and, 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 and in the most thorough way, he had to go outside of the city. People are too distracted in the big city. They can't concentrate to really transform themselves. And so that was the choice to get out. So the other main reason why he wanted to go to Toga is he wanted to create a, a place where it would be possible to encounter the other. It's something in Japan that's actually very difficult. It's, it's a homogenous uh, society and it's difficult to have meaningful connections with people outside of Japanese society. <laughs> And so in Toga, and the way it exists now, is there is every summer people from up to 20 countries come and gather there and they cross pollinate. They, they, they influence each other and different points of view are, are possible to encounter. So here we have Ellen Lauren, who's with us. And we also have uh, Tom Hewitt, who's a star of Broadway musicals. And he, he performed in pieces that were performed in English and Japanese, just as Ellen had done. And then the bunch of actors from the Moscow Arts Theater came to Toga and, and trained there as well. And then uh, an entire class from the Central Academy of Drama in China has just recently been uh, in Toga as well. It's a facility that has five theaters, uh, and 150 people can, can stay in the dormitories that are there. And, it's, and so his idea was then, this kind of place was necessary, a place where you could, in a very focused way, encounter the other, encounter someone from a culture different than your own, and, and many, and to see what you shared. But it's the kind of idealistic situation which would be incredibly expensive to do in a place like Tokyo. And also, it's because we live in this uh, era of terrorism, you know, whatever you do in a place like, uh, you know, Tokyo or New York, you're constantly being, uh, you know, people are looking at what you're doing. You're being surveyed you know, from the outside. And you have to be really careful with time. Mm. And you have to be careful with how you organize the space, right? So, you know, in order to have a free use of time and space, the only choice is to go up into the mountains. <laughs> the only people that are, you know, the only surveillance we have up there in the mountains are the, you know, the raccoons. <laughs> you know, they're the only ones who are watching what we're doing. <laughs> This last year there was a, a big incident in Toga. Uh, there was a huge landslide. There was a, you couldn't get in and out of the town for about a week. 
And it's a town where only 400 people live. And, and the people that live there now after this landslide, they all want to leave. And so he's thinking, well, that's pretty good. Now I can really do whatever I want. Uh, so he might have to ask the, the Mar Martins. Martin is a kind of a tree animal. They're the ones that will help him. So because uh, all of this happened, now they actually have a lot more support from the, the central government. All of this uh, land and facilities he's able to use for free. Is there something good out of a catastrophe? Maybe we'll take uh, one or two questions and then we have maybe TCG makes a short statement. But, but thank you again. Thank you very much. I also want to point out that Martin Siegel, after whom this theater actually is named, brought him, I think in 91, to the Festival of the International Arts. Um, I don't know if you remember Marty Siegel, um, who, who also brought him here for the last, one of the really great shows, um, the Dionysus. So um, I don't know how to do that, but we are really, uh, Tadashi Suzuki has to be out at 12.15, so we have one or two uh, questions. So um, one here and two. I'm uh, curious. Wait, one second, we'll be back. Uh, hi, I'm uh, curious how you feel your uh, teaching and your work has transformed since the 1970s to now. <laughs> has it changed? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Mm, but the world has changed. So he, he's, you know, the way the, in which message. the work, the, 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 the angle changes, uh, the angle of his work, his approach changes as the world changes. The, the strategy his, his directorial strategy and the, and the training itself hasn't really changed that much. I mean, of course he's a director and he has had a natural organic progression. He's gone from one text to another, different things he's been interested in, but his strategy and his philosophy is, has expanded, but it hasn't really, the, es the essence of it hasn't changed. Everybody, some people, when they meet him, they say, you haven't changed at all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but that, those are usually Japanese people that <laughs> say that. <laughs> so it, the, the philosophical point of view his, his, and his worldview He's, he's kept a, a, clear ang a clear point of view that's, that's developed and he's shifted it as the world has shifted. In, in the book, uh, Culture is the Body, there's an essay called uh, The Lonely Village. And that's something he wrote uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> but the ideas that are expressed in that article still hold true today. It might, they may, he may even be, he, he, he may even have more resolution behind those ideas today than he did when he wrote it. But you know, every day Japan is becoming more and more an, an urbanized country. So people are leaving from the countryside still today. So all the arguments that he was making in that are still quite true. So uh, we all know that Greek tragedy and also Shakespeare more or less play very significant in your work and your way of thinking. And you also mentioned a lot about French literature since you love French literature. So I wonder how French literature has changed your way of thought or your practition, if any. いやいや、そう、別に、別に、それはもう若い時に文学ですからね。あの、
ラスの戯曲はベケットサメルベケットっていう人の考え方は大変に出てます。So just in you know it was something especially when he was young that really influenced him and the one the writer who influenced him most was in fact Samuel Beckett as it were. So、うん、一番好きなのはギリシャヒネクとユリピデスとシェイクスピアとチェコフとベケット。He, his, he focuses most of his work on four playwrights, right? Euripides, Shakespeare,、uh, Chekhov, and Samuel Beckett. He, in terms of、uh, working with、uh, European playwrights, he almost never does work beyond those four. Well, he did do a, a version of、uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, but besides that, He sticks to those four generally. He's not interested in anything else, really. <laughs> Thank you. So,、um, we, we now come to the, the last uh, segment uh, the great publishers of uh, uh, Tadashi Suzuki's book, and many others、um, are here, Terry, to speak a bit about、uh, the, their relation, what they do. With him, and also there will be a signing、um, of、uh, some of the books here, just for your name, in case you have one or want、uh, to get one or want to have it signed somewhere else that、uh, is a, a possibility now and、uh, to take away from the many great things and significant things he said. But say for 10 years, the company went into a small mountain village on their own and without any uh, 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 influence on the outside and became a, a global, global force. And I think this is quite a, quite a stunning achievement. To, um, to have done that. So, Terry.、Uh, boy,、um, we had the, the incredible honor of having Tazashi Suzuki come to our conference in 1984.、Um, and that started a long relationship with my first boss, Peter Zeisler.、Um, and I think the little short film you'll see later will explain some of those connections a little bit fuller.、Um, but two years later, we had the honor of publishing the original book, which was The Way of Acting.、Um, Which has now been surplanted by Culture as the Body 30 years later, thanks to the, all the fantastic work of Cameron Steele.、Um, just a short note about who we are we're a theater communications group, we're a national organization for not for profit theater in the United States. Our role is to nurture, support, and celebrate the theater form in, the, in, in America.、Uh, we do lots of、uh, regranting programs, lots of convenings, lots of resources for.、Uh, Equity, diversion, and inclusion work.、Uh, we also publish,、um, and that's where our connection with Mr. Suzuki is here. And so, 30 years later, we're so thrilled that we could bring out the book the way we wanted to bring it out. So, thank you. Thank you. But now, a big applause for Tadashi Suzuki. Thank you. Come on, man. 78になったからね、いつアメリカに来れるかわからないのに、こういう機会を設けてくれてありがとう。So he's going to be 78 this year. He doesn't know if he's going to make it back to the US, so thanks for having me.